Hello, everybody. Welcome to our first exercise in module 11, looking at single population tests on variants. This one is going to be a one tail test, but again, we're going to make sure that we can figure that out for ourselves without being told. Now, this exercise is just an extension of the one that we did in module 9.1a, where we're looking at a local brewery filling up their bottles of beer. So in that exercise, of course, we were looking at means. We were looking at whether or not they were filling their bottles on average with at least the amount that it said on the label. On the label, it says they contain 12 ounces, we knew, we were told that there were severe penalties if it overstated the volume, which meant underfilling the bottles. So they performed some, some weekly tests where they took a sample of 25 bottles to test their filling machines. Over the past few years of weekly sampling, they've calculated the population standard deviation is 2.1 ounces. They would like this to be the maximum level of variation in their filling process. So periodically, this is tested as well. Okay, now this is giving us information about what type of test we're going to be doing. This week, the sample resulted in a mean filling volume of 11.4 ounces with a sample standard deviation of 2.55. Perform the test to determine if they're exceeding their maximum desired variance. Okay, well, that statement there is really telling us exactly what we need to do. Now, level of significance, 0.05. Just because we're doing tests on variance or standard deviations, that level of significance that we talked about early in module nine, it's still, it's still here. It still has the same meaning. It is still telling us our level of comfort in committing a type one error. Type one error still means the same thing of incorrectly rejecting a true null hypothesis. So here we are in module 11, but so much of what we've learned in previous modules carries through. It's all the same stuff. Okay, so let's formulate our test. So I have my null and I have my alternative. Here I know that we're testing variants, right? It says here, perform a test if they're exceeding their maximum desired variance. So I know just from the wording that we're testing the variance. Be really careful here because there's some information given in this problem that might lead you to maybe think you're doing a test on an average, right? I can see here that it's giving me a sample average. It's giving me a hypothesized or a targeted average. So there's information here that might lead me to think that we're doing a test on means. So don't, don't focus on the numbers that are given in the problem. Focus on the words of the problem and what it's, what it's telling you you need to be looking for. So I have a test here on variance. I want to see if we're exceeding their maximum desired. So are we more than that desired variance? Our desired variance here, well, we're given a standard deviation is 2.1. Now, one of the things that is advisable is to convert your numbers always to a variance. If you're given variances, fine, keep them as variances. If you're given standard deviations, it can be easier just to convert everything to a variance and then do your analysis. If you need to convert things back to a standard deviation later, like if we're doing a confidence interval approach, then by all means, we can do that at the end. But it's just a little bit safer to get into the habit of converting everything to a variance. So I have a standard deviation of 2.1, so that gives me a hypothesized variance of 4.41. We're doing a test to see if we're exceeding that target. So I want to test to see whether or not our variance gives us evidence to show that the population variance is greater than 4.41. Okay, our level of significance is 0.05. Justify that formulation. If the evidence supports the null hypotheses, then everything's fine. We're within our tolerable amount of variation. 
if the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, now we have evidence to show that we are exceeding our maximum desired variance. Okay, so we've got our test, calculate our test statistic. Well, we're doing a test on variance, so our test statistic is a chi-squared variable, which is going to be n minus 1 times that sample variance divided by our hypothesized variance. So here I've got all of the values that we need. Our sample size is 25, 25 minus 1. Our sample variance, so that's this one over here, is 2.55 squared divided by our hypothesized value. So here I could put 2.1 squared because that's what we were given. I've already squared it, so I'm going to put in that hypothesized value 4.41. Now I can calculate our chi-squared value. This is 24 times 2.55 squared divided by 4.41. That gives me a test statistic of 35.39. Does this feel similar? Does it feel familiar from all of the other tests that we've done? Yes, that little calculation was a little bit different. The notation in our test formulation is a little bit different. But it, the process is all the same, right? You've never done a test on a single population variance. But if I asked you at this point, what is the next step? Well, you're going to tell me to go to the distribution tables, find a critical value, find a p-value, because it's all the same. The little difference, of course, is that now we're working with a chi-square distribution. So I'm going to go down to a chi-squared table, and holy smokes, it looks just like a t-distribution. This is giving us the area in the upper tail, and here I have those degrees of freedom. Very similar to a T distribution. So our degrees of freedom, remember we had 25 observations in our sample. Degrees of freedom here is N minus 1, so I have 24 degrees of freedom. Our test statistic was 35 point probably doesn't matter. We don't need that level of precision here. 35.39. So same process as with our t-distribution. I follow along and I see, okay, my test statistic is in there, in between those two values. I follow those up to get the corresponding probabilities. This gives me an upper tail probability. So this means Here's this chi-square distribution, right? Some asymmetric distribution. I have two values. One of them, 33.2, 36.4. 33.2, That value of 36.4, well, that corresponds with an area of 0.05 in the upper tail. I'm looking at this number here. The value of 33.2, well, that's all of this area, including that. That corresponds to an area of 0.1 in the upper tail. So I'm looking at that value here. Now, our test statistic was 35 point something. So our test statistic is in here. 35.39. Well, what does that tell us about the probability? Well, that probability is greater than, right, this was that red area, so it's greater than 0.05, but it's smaller than that purple area, which was 0.1. It's the same idea as when we were working with the t-distribution. So that upper tail probability that gives us our p-value was less than 0.1, greater than 
0.05. So here we are for our p-value approach. We're doing this test at the 0.05 level of significance. The rejection rules are the same. The concept here is the same. That level of significance is telling me my level of comfort in committing a typo and error, in, in falsely rejecting a true null hypothesis. This p-value is telling me my actual exposure to committing a typo and error meaning that if the null is true and if I choose to reject it, well, my exposure here to a type 1 error is greater than the level of exposure that I'm comfortable with. Does this all sound familiar? It's the same as all of the other tests that we've done in earlier modules. My exposure to a type 1 error here is greater than what I'm comfortable with, we have insufficient evidence to reject the null hypotheses. Now, before we interpret that, let's just come back here. We'll look at our critical value approach. Again, it's, it's entirely the same as T distribution, except our tables are a little bit different. I come down here when we're looking for the critical value approach. I start with the probability, right? I'm looking for alpha. There's alpha, 0 0.05. So we've already identified that critical value here is 36.41. Now, just like every other test that we've done, in terms of our rejection rules, that critical value, well, that defines that rejection space. Right? We'll reject if our test statistic is greater than or equal to that critical value. Of course, our test statistic was here, was 35, 39. It is not greater than or equal to, it was less than. So that falls into that do not reject space. And once again, we will always get the same conclusion regardless of which approach we use. We use both approaches just really for practice. P-value approach is generally a more preferred approach to hypothesis testing. But we see here that we get the same conclusion. And, you know, for students who are just learning how to do all of this stuff, sometimes it's just good practice to do both the p-value approach and the, re um, and the critical value approach because they're redundant. And so it's a way you can kind of double check your answer to make sure you're on the right track. So both of those approaches, we have our critical value for a value of 0.05 in that upper tail was 36, now I forget already, 36.4. And our test statistic was smaller. We get the same conclusion. What does this all mean? Well, it means that we have insufficient evidence to reject the null hypotheses, which means we have no reason to worry about the level of variation in our bottle filling procedure. We are less than, or I should say we're not less than, we have evidence to show that we're not exceeding our maximum level of variation. Okay, so that's it. I hope it feels very familiar to you. I really want to make sure that I emphasize all of the similarities here. But again, make sure that you, you know, you're comfortable with those similarities. You're comfortable with that process. But always keep an eye out for those little differences, right? The different notation here, the different calculation for your test statistic, and of course, using the proper tables that follow the distribution that's relevant for your problem. Okay, thanks for watching everybody. I hope this was helpful. Bye-bye.